intellectual property is one of those things that can really change the dynamics for how something works in your life i'm not gonna obviously tell you what it does and what's all about that's <laughs> dr jogreni's job she's gonna tell you all of that Hi everybody, welcome to another Steamy Gram session. I'm Amanda and today we are talking intellectual property. Intellectual property 101. So anything you want to know about it, ask the questions. Dr. Anatin Jogweni will be here to answer all of them. Remember that comment section right there, that box is there for you to type whatever questions you have about intellectual property. Hi, Dr. Anati. I'm here. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing? How are you? I'm okay, mm -hmm. you? I'm good, thanks for yourself. <laughs> yeah. right, so obviously we are talking intellectual property today and you are a patent examiner. Yes. IPC, what is your role there? Basically, um, as a patent examiner, I deal with patents, which is another form of intellectual property. So what we do then is that, um, well, as you might have, I've got, I've got a glimpse of your introduction. Uh, so I'm sure you indicated to people that I actually work for the CIPC, which is um, custodian for intellectual property registration, which I'll be talking about um, today. So I focus on the patent side of intellectual property. So obviously in order for you to acquire intellectual property rights, you don't just get granted a patent just because you've come up with an invention. There are certain formal processes that have to be followed, you know, just to actually ensure that indeed whatever it is that you bring forward the invention is actually worth granting that patent because it is a right that gives you monopoly basically over everybody else so that's where then we come in whereby we look at your invention whether it will um actually conform to um the certain formalities that are required in order for you to actually be granted a patent so that's what i do then i examine the the actual inventions that are brought to our table to see whether they are actually worth um granting a patent so basically that's what i do okay that's actually quite quite interesting but now for everybody here let's assume we have no idea what intellectual property the basic, <laughs> the basic. <laughs> what is it <laughs> the what basic. Is it? okay so what is intellectual property if i could just give you a broad definition of what it is a very simplified definition so intellectual property, we just refer to it as the creation of the mind. So any creation that you, that your intellect actually allows you to come up with. So now um, such creations can range from your inventions. It can be your literary or artistic works. It can be your, um, be it your logos, your designs. All of those things that's what um is that's what intellectual property encompasses basically so any creations of the mind that actually do have um some commercial potential um to them you know because obviously not any creation that you come up with can actually be deemed intellectual property there has to be at least that commercial potential you know um of that had so that idea must actually at least have um the commercial potential and by that um because we consider ip to be an asset so somehow then uh, you have to it, it's an intangible asset it's something that you obviously cannot see but somehow it has to have the potential being translated to something that's tangible you know something that can actually be of commercial value so that's what intellectual property is Okay, so let's say I create an app, right? And it okay. functions um, the exact same way as Instagram, for example. But I don't call it Instagram. I call it, I don't know, Mandygram. I don't know. I call it something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Can I get IP rights for that? 
Well, the thing is with with intellectual property, the the it it would actually depend. Like I say that because sometimes you can't just look at something from face value and just say, okay, tick, you know, you get intellectual property. That's why you do have that that will then interrogate it, you know, and see the merits that it actually possesses. And with intellectual property, um, like one of the um, I would say universal requirements, if I should say, put it that way, when it comes to IP generally, is that your idea it has to be original. You know, it has to be new, which means that then obviously you'd have to do research to try and now look as to whether what you have, you know, it's not something that's already existing or it's not something that's already been done before. So you look at that then whether. It's something that's new, you know, that's original, um, whereby you, like, there, there's, there's also, it's an inventor, you know, it's inventive in the sense that there's also, like, some skill that has been applied to it and an effort that has been applied to it as well. So you have to interrogate such. So it's, it's always important that for you to actually do your research as well, to try and then look at what you have, like your product, and then do a comparison to what is probably being done out there already and see whether there is anything that distinguishes what you have to what's already what's already out there. And hence I was saying that then you you would definitely then have to look at what you have and try and elicit whether there is any originality um with with, with your concept, with your product to what is already out there in the market. That's how you can actually be able to determine whether you actually worth the IP rights. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what type of um, IP exists? I'm assuming it's not just patents. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Because I'm, I mean, I'm sure the one that everybody is very much familiar with, just that people probably didn't think that it's considered intellectual property, but you have. Um, so obviously patents, uh, and then you have your trade box. So everybody knows what trade box are. Uh, like as I indicated with the trademarks, now we're talking about your your logos. We're so talking about your signs. We're talking about your names. Any form of marks that basically distinguishes um, your goods or services. So, you know, as a business person. Um, so any, any 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 of those marks that would be able to distinguish your goods from any other uh, producer or manufacturer out there. So that's your trademarks, and then you have your designs as well. Um, so that's another type of trademark. So with your designs, basically we're talking about um, it ranges from your aesthetic design. So by aesthetic design, it could be a pattern that you come up with. It could be an ornamentation, it could be a shape of that sort that you can actually get protection for. And then you also have um, what you call functional um, designs as well. That is whereby maybe you, you, you come up with a design that um, gets, um, a design that actually gets protection just based on its functionality on that particular article, that particular object. And then the last one that, um, and now I'm talking from the South African um, landscape of IP. And then we also then have um, copyrights, which is also a, um, a very popular one as well. So with your copyrights, then we're now talking about um, artistic and literary work. So with artistic work, I mean, talking about music um, and the sort, you have your cinematography, you have your publications, book publications, even like in from a South African context, um, apps um, and, and 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 other digital, if I should say, um, devices. They are protected under our copyright. So you actually have those four copyrights in in, in South Africa that are registrable. Yes. Okay, and why is it so important to? Um, have IP rights for whatever thing, whether it's uh, maybe 
it's music that I produced, a, a song that I wrote and produced, or an artistic work that I drew. Why is it so? Why is it so important that I have IP rights for that? Well, as, as I mentioned um, in the beginning, you know, with IP, um, the focus is that, like, the, the, the whole purpose of it is to actually incentivize you as the creator. So it is important for you to actually acquire such rights because then it gives you monopoly. So what we mean by monopoly is that it obviously then it prevents anybody else from actually taking advantage of your creation, you know, because then if it so happens that there's somebody out there who's infringing, that is, who's copying your, create, um, your, your invention, but the fact that you actually have those rights, you know, because those rights, they actually exclude anyone from making, using, distributing, even duplicating your creation, whatever it is. So to a certain extent, then it, it, it kind of gives you it's not only monopoly because obviously with IP it's an asset. So like I said, that you can actually make um, it's, it's actually a commercial asset where you can actually really make a lot of money out of um, IP. I mean, you get like these big corporates like your Apple and your Microsoft where you, when you look at the company where you look at actually their profile, you know, the, the company, the asset profile, you find that maybe majority of it, um, like their revenue is generated from intellectual property, like from things such as licensing and stuff and not from the actual product itself that's being manufactured by, by the corporates. So then with, with, with acquiring IP rights, so like as I indicated, so the value add is that, is that you have that monopoly. You know, because it gives you that power whereby you can dictate um, who gets to use your IP at a certain fee. There's like a commercial um, gain for you. And it also actually protects you as well. Um, because now, if it so happens that you have an invention, but it so happens that you do not protect it, you, 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 cannot, you cannot necessarily now if it so happens that there's somebody who comes across your invention and decides to go there, modify it to make something out of it, you know, and then they, they make it big, you can't go and claim that they stole your invention because you don't have any proof of that. Do you understand? Whereas with um, having such rights, then it actually also just eliminates these unnecessary disputes now where you have to go and be pleading your case to people that know this is my thing because you can just say here's my IP rights I'm taking you to court you know kind of a thing so it, it actually just it, it, it actually puts you you know on a safe side from a commercial and legal side basically so yeah okay. okay you know when you with everything that you're saying it makes me think of some of the public battles that have happened uh, with, with musicians, for example, you'd have ordinary people who will come and accuse a musician or say that this musician no, stole my idea. This was my song. I put it maybe on my Facebook page and then this guy saw it, stole it, and it turned it into a song. But mm -hmm. my, my is how much does it cost to actually obtain IP rights? Because maybe the reason why some people don't file for IP rights because they're thinking, yo, it's going to cost me so much. At least now, knowledge we know is usually the first thing that causes people not to do things because they don't know about it. But now let's okay. say I do know about IP rights and I just posted my poem on Facebook and some artist sees it or somebody who works with the artist sees it. Next thing, it's a hit single. <laughs> what now? Okay, so with um, with the different aspects of IP, so there are obviously different formal processes that have to be followed. So it's not like with every registration, everyone has to actually conform to like the same checklist. For instance, um, the most affordable, if I should put it that way, into, like IP, um, IP right is copyright. Because copyright, you don't have to 
to actually register a copyright. By just the mere fact that you created the copyright, I mean, like, I mean, you, 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 you have the creation as the owner yeah. and you have actually written it down and it so happens that it's something that is skillful, you know, I mean, and, and, and it's something that a lot of effort has been put on it and it's actually even been recorded, then that on its own is you acquiring in, um, intellectual property rights. So you know, with, when it comes to copyright, you, you you don't you don't have to go to um, CIPC to go um, and register a copyright. But the fact that you created it, you know, you have ownership of that work. So like you were saying, so if it so happens that then there's somebody who copies something um, that you've posted out there, and it, 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 it is actually a creation that you. You, you've seen it actually has commercial uh, potential then it is within your right as the owner to go and uh, pursue the legal route against that person so long as you have your records something written down and recorded to show that actually you are the one that has come up with this so that's why it's always important to jot every single thing down i mean even when i was still a scientist that's what i was actually always told that the minute you actually jot something down write down the date of it as well if you can you know so that it's just record keeping you know you just keep the trail so that even if you find yourself in a compromised position like that where now you have disputes over it then you at least have evidence you know something that can actually hold that, 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 that will be to your advantage. So that is copyright. And then with um, designs, trademarks, and patents, mm. those you have to register them with the CIP. Oh. So all that information, I'm not clued up in terms of the, because I don't deal with the admin side. So in terms of the actual fees that have to be paid, but one thing I will tell you, like this is free advice. It's it's not expensive, and when I say it's not expensive, like it's it's, it's a relative amount. It's less than a thousand rand. So sometimes I worry about these people that go and have other agents or whatsoever in the streets, you know, um, applying for these things on their behalf. I'm like, it's such a zip off, because when you actually go to our website, you will see that it's 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 actually literally. Um, value for money, you know, most especially considering the amount of money you can actually make after you've actually acquired those rights. So if one actually wants to find out the cost and all of that, so they can go to the CIPC website. There is um, a designated area for intellectual property. Um, but then the one that I must probably just maybe highlight on it's patents because I deal with patents and patents they are like the most expensive if I should put it that way um it's the most expensive kind of intellectual property to register for as relative to the other one uh, but that should not deter people though and I would indicate um why I'm saying that because there are obviously initiatives to try and um, mitigate such financial challenges from people who have the potential of, of 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 who have like potential inventions but can don't have the financial muscle to, to protect them. So with patents, what normally happens is that um, so when you go there as an individual, you can go and you file um, your application, and we have what you call like a provisional provisional application. So the provisional application, it's just to at least um, give you proof that you are seeking protection. You know, although it's not guaranteed at the end that that protection, you will acquire the right, but it's at least a step towards you um, seeking that protection. You know, so when you at least file that provisional application, that's what we call it, then you can at least then, um, it, it, it kind of like gives you leverage because then, if anybody else decides to come and file 
for the same thing after you. So at least then in the system, there is something you are way ahead of them, if I should put it that way. But then with the, with, with the patients, though, um, there are obviously attorneys, I think, as well with the trade So there are processes, or within the actual application process, there is a bit where the attorneys, they actually do come in. And unfortunately, then that's when now the cost, they kind of escalate, you know, because we're looking at maybe above 20K that you would actually... <laughs> yeah. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is actually, no, yeah. It is, it is, it is actually quite, quite, it is actually quite cheap, you know. So, but, but like I, as I, I said, there are actually um, incentives that have been put in place, for instance, with the CIPC, uh, whereby we try to um, assist inventors. Um, there's an inventors assistance program in place uh, where um, any individual or inventor who believes that the idea I mean, the invention has got, um, it, it, it has great potential, you know, it has um, a, a great commercial potential. Then they could actually just apply to the CIPC um, for consideration of um, their uh, in, invention for finding purposes. And then what the CIPC does then is that they will try and then pair up um, that successful inventor with um, a patent attorney who will then do the whole filing process and application for them pro bono. And pro bono meaning free, free, free of charge, where they do not necessarily now have to be incurring this exorbitant, sorry to put it that way, um, I mean, exorbitant amounts such as, such as 20,000 or so. So, so there are actually initiatives in, in place for when when it comes to that. So yeah, basically. Okay, so the takeaway here is that rather file um, for IP rights, if it's, except for copyright, you said copyright is the cheapest. Basically, if I write something and I date it, I've basically copywritten it just like that. But in terms of the other ones, like my logos, my designs, my so forth, I'll rather just apply, take the plunge, pay that fee, just yeah. so that I can protect myself so that nobody can decide they're gonna use this and make money off it. We we like we encourage that. Like it, it, I think it actually just puts you on, on the safe side. And especially when it comes to um SMMEs, you know, like entrepreneurs and, and stuff. I mean we, we, we've seen, we've, we've witnessed um, such um, unfortunate or like such negative stories whereby you'll find that the somebody's invention that has been hijacked because it so happened that they disclosed it. And there was somebody who had a better financial muscle who just decided to take that idea and run with it. And so unfortunately, you, when you come back and you cry and you say that so and so stole my idea, then we'd be like, no, but according to the CIPC register, it's under this person's name, you know? So sometimes we'll find that with, with the entrepreneurs, because you're so desperate for that funding, then you go around, you know, sharing your idea with anyone and everyone who's promising you that they are going to fund you, you know? But you're forgetting that you're actually putting your intellectual property at risk. Basically, you're just giving it away just like that. So mm -hmm. that's why I always advise that before you do anything, even if you get tempted, before you even utter, you know, that idea. I mean, just go to CIPC website, register it, you know. At least you know that there is something, a formal document that protects you before you can end up going out there and finding yourself being, being, being disadvantaged or being compromised. So, yeah. Hmm. Wow. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's actually very helpful, especially for the entrepreneurs, because 
that is something we risk a lot all the time because we all know as entrepreneurs the biggest thing is that startup capital and you yeah. will and i mean when you go to somebody and you ask for funding you can't just be like please find me for something i can't tell you <laughs> you know you, you you have to tell them what you have it is. To you have to disclose so at least if you know that you've registered it then it puts you at ease because you you're disclosing but knowing that you're protected that's why it's like intellectual property protection you know so at yeah. least you know you are covered you know you've covered your basis and stuff yeah. Yeah, that's very important. We actually have a question here. The question is, if um, I acquire IP rights in South Africa, it doesn't matter whether it's um, trademarks, patents, what so forth, does that um, go across board like globally or is it just only in South Africa? No, no. With, with IP rights, they are territorial, you see because they're territorial in the sense that they will be, they will confine you to that particular jurisdiction. Because obviously with IP, it's governed by certain legislations, like by certain laws. And so if you go from country to country, you find different legislations, you know, in place. So obviously South African law, when it comes to patents, be different to Europe, will be different to America and stuff so each 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 country has got its own set of legal um or legislations in place when it comes to ip so you can't so but then what happens is that then you obviously there are provisions in place then like um whereby if for instance let's say you are applying for a patent or applying for um a trademark then you have to actually in your application maybe specify the territories whereby you're seeking protection. So there is that provision as well where you will say maybe I'm seeking protection in this country, in this country, in this country. So obviously you will come, that will be subject to like um, various fees, you know, whether you prepared to pay for that or you don't, but um, so to answer that person's question, uh, no, IP rights, they are territorial, you know, they're only applicable as far as the country where you want protection or where you are seeking protection. But otherwise, if it so happens that you're interested now in getting protection wherever, 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 you still have to do an application um, to the forms if I should put it that way, of the legislations within those particular jurisdictions. So yeah, that's how it works. Okay. And obviously just to bring it into context, so that it's not so abstract. So is that why, for example, um, look, let's say Louis Vuitton doesn't have any standing ground necessarily on somebody in Long Street who sell, who's selling um, or somebody in Small Street you know, who's selling a LV knockoff. They can't do anything about it, can they? Um, you see, that's now counterfeit. So that's like now a different aspect of IP. But to a certain extent, they could, because that is actually infringement, if you if you actually think of it that way, because they, they, they are actually infringing. Um, in their design, so it, they have it within their legal rights to actually um, file lawsuits against those people. But I mean, let's be practical. Uh, if now Louis Vuitton had to go around chasing people in small streets, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. even just uh, because the, 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 the tricky thing is, you know, with with with. Um, IP, like just the space itself, it's the it's the le legality of it, you know, that's where the money comes in, you know, all these court proceedings and stuff. But otherwise, when it comes to your registration and whatnot, those are basic things. The challenge only comes once the intellectual property rights have been enforced, you know, because then now everything it becomes legal. And legal also, there's a lot of money, you know, that's involved in there so now Louis Vuitton would actually probably have to think whether 
is it honestly worth their time or worth mm. their mind having to go around chasing people in small spaces <laughs> them now to to actually stop infringing <laughs> so like yeah. they decide no i don't think it would actually be worth their time or worth their money yeah okay all right so we have another question uh twofold so who qualifies to you know file for a patent or any ip rights for their work in south africa specifically a patent for their work in south africa and what documents are required okay so um who qualifies to patent their work um it's any legal person by legal person it can be an individual it can be an entity a company you know so long so long as you are the inventor or you invent something but then obviously the other thing that i need to actually highlight so it, it in terms of now acquiring the rights i guess with any other intellectual property so we'll say that the creator of the work is the one that is would be deemed the owner of the work you know the same that with the patent if you invented the invention then we would um automatically assume that you know the patent those rights actually accrue to you but sometimes it actually is also subject to whatever maybe contractual agreement you know you might actually enter into because sometimes you do find that there are inventors who actually are not owners of patents for instance in the case of a university student if it so mm. happens that you come up with a brilliant invention in the university but it's not yours because you are bound by maybe the university's memorandum of understanding you know same thing applies with corporate as well you could be an engineer working for Sasol and you come up with like this brilliant invention but it does not belong to you based on whatever contractual agreement that you have with the company the same thing with um also a uh, book publication where if it so happens that you publish your book through a publisher you know as much as yes you are the creator but you the ownership does not go to you so it's always subject to whatever um it's 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 always subject to maybe whatever contractual agreement whatever legal agreement that you enter into but then obviously now if you as the individual decide to take it upon yourself you take the initiative to go about seeking those intellectual property rights then obviously then you are the rightful owner of that ip basically and second question documents that are required i can't think of them at the top of my head i don't want to mislead you but like i said i it's always fair to just refer you to our website which is dipc like which is companies and intellectual property website you just look for the um intellectual property online um tab and it will give you all the information that's there including the fees as well that a person can actually pay um when they're registering for the IP yeah all right that's helpful so we have another question um how do i go about registering an event concept and name um yeah okay. Well, um event concept and name. Mm. With the name bit, with the name bit obviously then that would fall under trademarks, but the actual concept itself. Um well, I would assume that because with 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 things such as business models, business ideas, you, you can't patent such things. So I guess the best the best form of protection that the person would get would be um copyright um to actually be um a copyright so so long as they've actually written it down they've recorded it for of some sort and then they 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 they, they, they could actually copyright it so they wouldn't necessarily have to then register it you know by the mere fact that they've actually um created it and it's something that's been documented that that qualifies um for such um a concept to be to um it it actually qualifies for a uh, copyright protection I'll say yeah is there anything else maybe that you think I might have missed 
that you think is really important for us to know? Um, well, nothing much, but like as I indicated initially, um, the CIPC, it has a program space, uh, which are aimed at, um, well, they advocate for IP um, awareness. So people must actually just go onto um, our website because what was happening was that before before the lockdown, we actually had a unit within CIPC that was designated solely for um, IP wellness and education where a few guys would actually just go around the country to give talks and presentations um, on what IP is all about. And there are also, as I indicated now, programs that have been streamlined to target SMMEs as well. So we also have such programs in place where everyone has gone um, virtual now. So they can actually always go onto the CIPC website as well to get any information regarding the dates whereby these um, live uh, IP sessions, um, IP wellness sessions will be will be carried out. And I also mentioned as well that for guys, entrepreneurs that believe they have um, potential inventions, you know, that um, innovative ideas that are worth granting patents, but somehow are in compromised positions where they don't have the financial means to um, apply for such protection. As I indicated, there are initiatives in place, like in, to, um, there's an inventors assistance program um, mm -hmm. that CIPC has faced um, in collaboration with the intellectual property organization. So they can actually also go onto our website and have a look at um, that assistance program in place and they can then submit their applications and yeah so that's 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 all the information that i can actually share but otherwise CIPC is a very useful very user-friendly website they can always go on to it it has all the information regarding registration etc and the programs in place um, it, it, it has all of that, so people can actually go there and, and make use of it, yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you so, so much. I've actually learned a lot from this session. Um, some things I actually didn't know, I didn't realize, or didn't take note of, of, oh, that's actually something you can get IP rights for or something like that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So especially i think the most important thing was that entrepreneur part you spoke about that funding thing where you go around and you ask people for funding you tell them your idea the whole time i never yeah. really thought of it on the way of first protect your idea then mm. tell them, you know exactly. but now we know and i think that's very useful for anybody who wants to start a business so thank you so so much for this i really appreciate it i'll make sure that i put down the CIPC's website for people so that they can just Thank know what it is to it. Mm -hmm. So I'll make okay. sure that I put that link on. No problem. Well, the pleasure was all mine. I thank you for the opportunity. I actually quite enjoyed the session. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad. <laughs> so have a good day, brother. And for everybody watching, thank you so much for watching. All right. Goodbye. Thank you, Amanda. Bye. Bye.